Good evening, uh, my dear friends and viewers from uh, all over the world. Today is the Thursday uh, clinical night uh, at CDC. Uh, today is the start of a very important uh, group of uh, sessions, actually. Webinars will be discussing the different uh, subjects involved in the valvular heart disease. Uh, we will discuss each valvular lesion in a separate webinar, and this will be followed by discussing the prosthetic valves and the endocarditis. And every different form of intervention will be discussed as well, derived from the European Society of Cardiology guidelines, most recently updated in 2017. So tonight's scope will include an introduction to the valvular heart disease guidelines, and discussing the mitral valve stenosis as the first Rainy? valve in the form Rainy. of case-based discussions. Tonight, the lectures will be first an introduction to the valvular heart disease, discussing the clinically relevant issues, followed by a glimpse from the guidelines of mitral stenosis. I will have the honor to present those two parts. This will be followed by discussing and showing three different clinical scenarios for mitral stenosis presentations. And this will be discussed by my dear friend, Professor Karim Mahmoud, lecturer of cardiology at Cairo University. I'm very honored and glad to have tonight on board two very elegant and scientific moderators sharing this session with us. Professor Rada Qazamil, cardiology consultant at National Heart Institute, and Professor Amir Anwar, cardiology lecturer at Cairo University. So after this short introduction, I will move quickly to show what we have on board tonight. So the first part of the lecture, as we said, is derived from the most recent update of the 2017 guidelines for the management of the valvular heart disease. And as we know that the class one recommendation showed in the green color means that it is recommended and indicated to be followed. While class two, it means that there is some conflicting evidence regarding this particular point. The class 2A shows that the weight of evidence is in favor of the use, usefulness and efficacy, while class 2B, that it's less well-established use. I think we have a, a connection problem at Zahran. Uh, till he, uh, he is back with us, uh, let me uh, welcome uh, Dr. Ghada Kauzamil and Dr. Uh, Amir uh, Anwar for joining us in this uh, first uh, valvular heart disease uh, webinar. Um, and uh, I'd like to have uh, some words from uh, Dr. Ghada. Dr. Ghada, welcome uh, among us. السلام عليكم أتمنى أن يعني يبقى يوم لطيف و very successful scientific meeting في الأول طبعا أنا سعيدة جدا إن أنا أجوين this very eminent group في area of interest I think إنها مش واخدة حقها قوي أو جزء كبير منها مش واخد حقه ال ال rheumatic heart disease Yes. Uh, how are you, uh, Professor Reda? Welcome on board. Ahlan Zeka, Dr. Zahran. Abbarak. Amiri. Welcome. Alhamdulillah. Nakamil ma hadradak? I got, we got disconnected here at the level of evidence. So the level of evidence A is data derived from the multiple randomized clinical trials or meta-analysis. The level of evidence B is the data that is derived from singular randomized trial or multiple non-randomized studies, while the level of evidence C is derived from a consensus of opinion or a small number of retrospective studies or registries. So I will move to part one, which is the introduction to the valvular heart disease. And we need to see what are the essential questions needed to evaluate a patient before performing a valvular intervention. And those questions are mainly two main questions. Number one, 
how severe is the valvular heart disease? Is it mild, moderate, or severe? Determined by the clinical and the imaging approaches. And number two, how symptomatic is the patient? Is the patient mildly symptomatic, moderately symptomatic, or severely symptomatic? Those are the two main questions that need to be addressed regarding any valvular disease, how severe it is and how symptomatic it is. It's important to know as well what is the cause of this valvular heart disease and are the patient's symptoms really related to this valvular heart disease or they are related to a coexistent or concomitant cardiac or non-cardiac condition. And if the patient is asymptomatic, but the valvular lesion is severe, do we have any additive signs that indicate a worse prognosis and may mandate an intervention in an asymptomatic patient yet severe valvular lesions? Of course, in the context of the patient's life expectancy and the expected quality of life. Before performing any intervention, whether on the valve, whether on the coronaries, or whether on any aspect regarding the cardiology practice, you have to weigh the benefits of this intervention versus the spontaneous outcomes of not intervening upon this particular problem. And you need to know that there is always a medical option and interventional option and a surgical option and what chooses between different types of surgeries, example, valve replacement versus valve repair versus a specific form of the intervention will depend upon the local resources available for the whole country, including the local experience and outcome data for this particular center regarding this particular intervention, taking into consideration what would the patient prefer to perform or to choose regarding his condition. So actually, this moves us to the next question. So in the era of 2017 and beyond, now we are in 2020, do we have something called a heart valve center? And the answer is yes. We do have a predefined requisites for what is known as the heart valve center. The heart valve center involves multidisciplinary teams who have different competencies in valve replacement, aortic root surgery, mitral tricuspid, aortic valve repairs, transcatheter aortic and mitral valve techniques, including redo operations and redo interventions, because with prolonged longevity now for the patients, a lot of redo operations and redo interventions are being performed. Of course, there should be regular meetings for the heart team discussion, including those standard operating procedures. This cannot be performed without a very good and proper imaging team, including the 3D and stress echocardiography procedures the intra and perioperative transesophageal echocardiography, of course, a CT, MRI, and in certain situations, a PET CT. This should involve regular sharing of data and consultation with the community in general, the other hospitals, the other non-cardiac departments, and the non-invasive cardiologists and surgeons, as well as those interventional cardiologists. And this should include backup and inter-servicing between different medical specialities to get out the most important outcome of all the practice, which is data. And this data should be reviewed for internal audit process to improve the mortality and reduce the complications and show the repair rates, the durability of repair and the reoperation rate. And this should be revised at least every one year. And those results should be open and available for review internally and externally. Of course, it would be of great benefit to participate in the natural, national or European quality database. 
after this brief introduction about how would I classify a valvular heart disease as severe, and I ask myself the question, how severe is the VAL disease and how severe is the patient's symptoms, and preferably performing valvular interventions, whether transcatheter or surgery, in the context of a specific heart valve center, we move to two important co-associated issues always meeting us in patients with valvular heart disease, which is concomitant coronary artery disease as number one and concomitant atrial fibrillation as number two. So very briefly, usually when we send a patient to perform a cardiac surgery, we need also to have a look on his coronary arteries because if he may need to perform a cabbage procedure plus his valvular heart disease replacement, so which patient is candidate for coronary angiography and what is the update regarding the use of CT coronary angiography. So of course, as we know that coronary angiography is indicated before valvular surgery in any patients with severe valvular heart disease and a history of cardiovascular disease or suspected myocardial ischemia or depressed LV systolic function. And of course, of course in gentlemen beyond 40 years of age and in postmenopausal females, or if the patient has one or more cardiovascular risk factors. And if it is not severe valvular disease, in case of moderate or severe secondary mitral regurgitation, because the threshold to perform the surgery in secondary mitral regurgitation to ischemia is a little bit less. So you need to perform coronary angiography as well to evaluate patients with ischemic heart disease and moderate to severe secondary mitral regurgitation. Do we have an option to use CT scan? Yes, we do. And this was reintroduced in 2017, our guidelines. CT angiography should be considered as an alternative to coronary angiography in the same profile of patients, actually, which is patients for CT scan, those with low probability for coronary artery disease, or for example, in a patient with severe aortic regurgitation and aortic aneurysm or aortic dissection. In this profile of patient, conventional coronary angiography may be technically difficult or associated with a high risk for example, in this case, extension of the dissection flap. And indications for myocardial revascularization include, of course, any coronary artery diameter stenosis more than 70%. Of course, this is in addition to the planned valvular surgery. Or as a class 2a in those with coronary artery diameter stenosis of 50 to 70 percent so if you have a patient with a more than 50 percent coronary artery diameter stenosis and he's going to perform a valve surgery whether mitral or aortic it would be wise as well to perform a cabbage by bypassing this stenosed coronary artery of course, the situation would be towards PCI if he's going to perform a transcatheter or a transaortic intervention. So if the patient is going to perform a TAVI, for example, and he has a coronary artery diameter stenosis beyond a 70%, of course, he will do a PCI to his coronary and he will do the TAVI for the aortic valve. While if the patient also is going to perform a transcatheter mitral intervention, the same recommendation applies here. Okay, so the final point in the first part of this will be the management of atrial fibrillation in those subset of patients with valvular heart disease. And with the introduction of the novel oral anticoagulants, they are actually should be considered as an alternative to the vitamin K antagonist 
in the patients with aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation, and mitral regurgitation presenting with atrial fibrillation, and in mild mitral stenosis as well. The novel oral anticoagulants also should be considered as an alternative to the VKAs after the third month of implantation of a bioprothesis aortic valve, whether by transcatheter or whether by surgery. So if you perform a tissue valve, whether by transcatheter TAVI or whether by surgery, you may consider or you should consider the use of NOAX after the third month. Of course, the NOAX are not recommended in the patients with atrial fibrillation and more than mild mitral stenosis. So if you have a moderate or severe mitral stenosis, the novel oral anticoagulants fail to show the same protection like the VKAs. And of course, they also fail in those patients with mechanical valve. You cannot give a patient with a metallic valve, for example, a novel oral anticoagulant. Regarding the surgical intervention for the AF, by which we mean the surgical division of the atrial fibrillation fibers, the surgical ablation of the atrial fibrillation by surgery should be considered in patients with symptomatic atrial fibrillation who are undergoing a valve surgery. And the surgical ablation may be considered in those patients with asymptomatic atrial fibrillation if this is surgically feasible with the minimum risk. And this is a class 2B because the number of the centers around the world actually experience it regarding this particular procedure in the asymptomatic patients are generally few. And of course, the surgical excision or external clipping of the left atrial appendage may be considered in patients undergoing valve surgery to reduce the thromboembolic risk and the further later need for uh, oral anticoagulation. So I will stop here. I will pass the mic to Professor Reda. If she would like to give any comment or ask any question regarding the first part, which was the introduction and management of coronary artery disease and atrial fibrillation in valvular heart disease patients. So please, Professor Reda, you have the mic now. Uh, well, uh, many thanks, Dr. Zahran. Uh, it is very informative. Can I have any explanation or in can ليها راشونال ان الجايد لاين لما جت تفرق العيان اللي هو عنده كرونري ارتر ديزيز ويز فالفولر ديزيز كان الكلام ان انت يو ويل جو فور كافيج بلس فالف ريبليسمنت لو عندك الاستينوزس مور ذان 70 ما ذكرش الراشونال اوف انترفنشن مع ان الريزلت بتاعت الانترفنشن دلوقتي في الايرا بتاعت الدراج لودنج ستنت بتقرب قوي من السرفايفل بتاع الفينس جرافت ايفن ات از ماتش بيتر ذان فينس جرافت رغم ان هو لما جه يتكلم على التافي قال نقدر نعمل كرونري انترفنشن ويز تافي ديسبايت ان التافي دلوقتي نزل ما بقاش للعيان الهاي ريسك بس اللي انا خايف عليه من السرجري لا ده نزل للمودريت اند ايفن دلوقتي نزل لللو ريسك بيشنت فانا مش لاقيه لها اكسبلانيشن يعني هو متوقع ان يعني قيسها على السرفايفل والاثنين واخدين في الايفيدنس آه الايفيدنس بتاعته سي يعني اكسبرت اوبينيون فكان بالنسبه لي الكلمه الموضوع ده عندي فيه ديبيت مش قادره يعني افهم آه الجزئيه دي ليه مش متساويه راي حضرتك ايه؟ This is a very good question professor Reda. I will retranslate it into English because we have some international viewers on the YouTube. So I'm sorry. Uh, uh, no, yes. Most uh, welcome. Yeah, so yes. Professor okay. Reda was asking about the hybrid approach for intervention in patients with valvular heart disease with the advances of the available options for intervention nowadays. Why would why would we put a saphenous vein graft for a 50 or 70 percent lesion in the right coronary artery? while we are performing a mitral or aortic valve replacement, for example, instead of putting simply a stent in the RCA. This is very important because actually, as Professor Reda noticed, this is a level of evidence C. It is based upon expert opinion rather than actually big randomized clinical trials. 
because the number of patients, of course, needed to make some statistical significance will be a little bit big, and you will not be able to get those patients to compare those with hybrid procedures versus those only with surgical procedures. But actually, this is a very important point, which I do agree with her about this particular situation. What is the problem if you would perform a stent, for example, to this RCA instead of performing the saphenous venous graft intervention? Actually, Professor Reda, and as we know, she knows the answer because this actually came from most of the European registries and most of the European centers. Actually, performing a vein graft or performing even a RIMA to the RCA in those, in those centers is as easy as, or not say as easy as, but is actually very much easier than compared to Egypt, for example because the surgical advances, the surgical tools, the surgical equipment, the endoscopic repair and the endoscopic surgeries performing the cabbage nowadays out there give the patients only one to two days of in-hospital admission for a very simple procedure that can be done even on pump rather than off pump. I would like also to ask Professor Amir, because I know he's one of the most eminent in Cairo University regarding valvular heart disease. Regarding this particular point, Professor Amir, would you prefer the patient to perform an intervention for a single coronary artery disease to reduce the surgical burden, the surgical, the surgical risk, I mean the duration of the surgery, the post-operative care, the post-operative recovery, by performing an intervention? And then this patient can also enter the surgery on his dual antiplatelet therapy or delay the surgery for one month, which option would you prefer? Please uh, unmute yourself. Yes. At the beginning, uh, thank you for Dr. Zahran for uh, the excellent presentation and thank you Dr. Reda for, uh, for the question. Uh, at first, let's agree that uh, uh, we don't have any evidence which approach uh, is better, whether to do intervention and then the valve surgery or uh, whether to do uh, cabbage uh, surgery with, uh, with, uh, uh, at the timing of valve surgery. So we don't have evidence. This is the first point. The second point, uh, uh, if we think about uh, percutaneous intervention, we will uh, have the dilemma of uh, antiplatelet therapy, whether to uh, put a stent in, uh, in the epicardial coronary artery and then wait for uh, three to six months on antiplatelet uh, therapy or whether to proceed for the surgery on uh, DAPT. Uh, so this, this will be the first dilemma. The second dilemma, uh, if we uh, postpone the percutaneous intervention uh, after surgery, uh, we will expose the patient uh, to the risk of uh, ischemic event during uh, cardiopulmonary uh, during cardiopulmonary surgery. So uh, it might be uh, uh, much feasible and much protective for the patient just to put a graft at the time of surgery instead of exposing him to the risk of uh, ischemia during, during the surgery. Uh, so uh, I think till we have uh, randomized trials, uh, uh, the routine uh, approach is uh, to do the valve surgery uh, in addition to uh, coronary artery bypass grafting at the time of surgery. Professor Red. Um, I have one comment for, for that. Do we need a guideline or we need more a randomized trial to support uh, these data in the guideline? Do we need more and more guideline and update in the guideline? Or we need to take this uh, uh, evidence C by multiple double-blind randomized trial to have a support which of which. As most of us know, Tavi now uh, go downwards to the uh, uh, intermediate and even low-risk patient. So, and even the age, 
uh, first we are selecting the patient who is so fragile above 80 or above 75. Now we are reducing the age and reducing the risk for the patient. So a lot of questions will be uh, raised by multiple issues. Why this and why not this? If we said that it is due to the risk and the, what is the risk from uh, the, the valvular affection or the ischemia from the coronary to, to look for the problems in the uh, related to the valve, it is not all the time is acute valve affection. Usually you see the patient for his long natural history with deterioration of the valve very gradually. And actually, you did multiple risk stratification of the patient to look for the, uh, the rapid intervention for the patient by valve replacement. It is only in uh, acute uh, aortitis syndrome. It may be due to rupture cause or something like that. It, it is actually calculated risk. You are not uh, uh, emergency found that your patient uh, need today valve replacement. So you can put a plan, a long uh, plan for him because actually you will reduce the time of the uh, surgery first. You will uh, help in mobilization of the uh, patient more as most of the valve replacement now uh, done by minimal or microscopic procedure, all to bring the patient mobilized and reduce the dilemma of infection and blood loss so why we didn't put that as a question for the future strategy in management of valvular disease? Totally agree with you. I totally agree with you, Professor Reda, actually, because also in Egypt, we are facing rheumatic heart disease patients and they are presented surgically at a younger age, uh, maybe in the Western society or the Western countries in the European and the American, most of the patients presented are senile patients who so those patients with senile degeneration of the valves rather than rheumatic patients so they are presented at an older age we have patients here performing valve surgeries at age of 30 35 40 45 younger patients actually and as you said the surgery here is not like the surgery there the recovery the post-operative period the risk of pre-operative infection and the immobility post-operatively and the post-operative care and the ICU here would move us towards taking the decision of reducing the surgical procedure to the minimum and carrying the burden on the intervention rather than performing the surgery. So the second actually point, I guess, will be also the point of the cost because let's say in the governmental sponsored patient in a country like Egypt, you need to get a government sponsorship to perform a PCI procedure for an X, and then you will get another government sponsorship to perform a cabbage procedure by another X. So this uh, particular patient will be uh, financially 2X, but if he performs a surgery only, he will get financially 1X. I mean, it's a lot of uh, multiple factors involved here, one of them is technical, definitely technical, and one of them is medical post-operative management, but also uh, the economic one is also involved here. So this is a very nice point. And I think countries like Egypt and countries like maybe India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, those kinds of countries where we still have rheumatic heart disease and the valvular heart disease presentation of the patients are different profiles than the Western countries. We also have some specific national guidelines for this particular profile of patients and should be tailored according to our economic and logistic uh, situation. So this is actually a very, very good and a very targeted question towards someone working in the population and in the field. Thank you, thank you so much, Professor Reda, for raising this excellent uh, point. Uh, Professor Amir, do you have any particular comment or question regarding the management of coronary artery disease or atrial fibrillation concomitantly in the valvular heart disease patients? Yes, I just have uh, uh, two comments that I, uh, I would like to highlight. The first one is regarding uh, 
we agreed that uh, the first step in assessment of valvular heart disease is to assess the symptoms. Uh, I just would like to uh, highlight that uh, this job is not always easy. Assessment of symptoms in patients with uh, valvular heart disease uh, sometimes uh, is not an easy job. Uh, uh, many patients uh, are apparently asymptomatic. And uh, in these cases, uh, we need to make sure that whether the patient is truly asymptomatic or uh, he's just uh, leading a sedentary life or he's limiting his activities. So, uh, and uh, here will come the role of uh, exercise testing in patients uh, who are asymptomatic with uh, severe valvular lesions. This is the first comment. The second comment uh, on uh, atrial fibrillation ablation during the surgical procedure and uh, left atrial appendage closure, uh, we need to remember that all the trials uh, have failed to show any mortality or morbidity benefit associated with surgical ablation of AF or uh, with uh, surgical uh, ligation of the left atrial appendage. And so uh, uh, these both procedures are only done for symptomatic purposes. And, on, and also we need to remember that uh, uh, following these procedures, still the patients will need to continue on uh, oral anticoagulation uh, for life. Uh, so uh, this, just, this, this were just comments. What is beautiful actually about the valvular heart disease as a subspeciality and when you study the valvular heart disease, is that in every single aspect of every single valvular region, you get the first, the first point that jumps to your mind, as Professor Amir said, the quality of life of the patient and the activity of the patient and the symptomatic burden upon the patient. This is very important. I mean, we do not need to perform. Of course, it would be a very good and a very nice advantage to have every single procedure to improve the mortality and have a mortality impact on the patient but with heart valves actually most of the interventions are directed towards symptomatology of the patient and quality of life you can get a 70 years old gentleman in europe that goes jogging every day for 30 or 60 minutes at 6 a.m in the morning and he's fully active and then he suddenly feels that his aortic stenosis that is asymptomatic yes but it is severe by echocardiography, for example, this aortic stenosis is hindering his daily activity. So he would be indicated. You can find the middle age or young lady that is contemplating to get pregnant and she has aromatic stenosis, which may be not that tight by echocardiography, but it's causing her severe symptoms and hindering her ability to get pregnant and complete her pregnancy without having severe respiratory distress, for example. So this patient would be indicated for a percutaneous mitral commissurotomy, whether before contemplating pregnancy or even while she is pregnant. So this is very beautiful. As Professor Amir said, you need to adequately assess the symptomatic situation of your patient and if you cannot assess it by direct questions or if the patient is leading a sedentary lifestyle, it would be better to perform something like an exercise test to provoke those symptoms. And this will be discussed in the second part of the lecture. So I think now it is time to show the second part of the lecture because Professor Karim will show us in the second half of this webinar actually three elegant scenarios for different patients with mitral stenosis for which the decision would be different in every particular patient. So this is a very short, just glimpse, just a look at some slides from the ESC guidelines. As you can see here, what are the indications for percutaneous mitral commissurotomy as interventional cardiologist and mitral valve surgery as a surgical option in clinically significant mitral stenosis, by which we mean the calculated or the estimated mitral valve area is less than or equal to 1.5 centimeters square. 
So, of course, if the patient has a, favor, a favorable characteristic for a percutaneous mitral commissurotomy and is symptomatic and his vulva area is less than 1.5, then percutaneous mitral commissurotomy is a class 1 indication. Of course, if this patient may be not so favorable by echocardiographic criteria, but he is deemed to have a high risk for surgery or a contraindication for surgery, percutaneous mitral commissurotomy is still a class 1 indication in those subsets. In those subset of patients that who are severely symptomatic or just symptomatic but are not suitable for percutaneous mitral commissurotomy by what we call the anatomical criteria, which we will say later, the mitral valve surgery will be the only available option to relieve this obstruction to the mitral valve. And of course, percutaneous mitral commissurotomy should be considered as the initial treatment in symptomatic patients with suboptimal anatomy, but no unfavorable clinical characteristics for percutaneous mitral commissurotomy, which by which we mean the patient has a very old age or a history for previous commissurotomy or an EHA class 4 heart failure, atrial fibrillation or pulmonary hypertension, because those patients would be deemed very high risk to perform the surgery and the percutaneous mitral commissurotomy would be a very good option for those subset of patients. Do they have a role in asymptomatic patients? But of course, the anatomical criteria are favorable. Yes, we still have a role here in those with very high thromboembolic risk that has a previous history of systemic embolization or what we call spontaneous echo contrast in the left atrium or a new onset for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation with or without associated high risk of hemodynamic compensation, decompensation in the form of elevated systolic pulmonary arterial pressure, more than 50 millimeters mercury at rest, or a need for a major non-cardiac surgery, example, is going to perform a uh, uh, big uh, abdominal surgery, for instance, or you need to perform something brain surgery or something that's considered as a major non-cardiac surgery, or simply a young aged lady that, as we said, desires to get pregnant, but this mitral stenosis would be hindering her quality of life and symptomatology during the pregnancy. So what are the contraindications for the percutaneous mitral commissurotomy? Of course, if the valve area is more than 1.5, usually in most of the cases, the symptoms are not related to the mitral stenosis because as we know, the mitral stenosis, by definition, by echocardiography, if the mitral valve area is less than 2.5. So you have a 1.5 to 2.5. So usually in this one centimeter, the patient does not complain, does not complain of uh, symptoms related to mitral stenosis. But as you can see downstairs under the table, the percutaneous mitral commissurotomy may be considered in patients with a valve area even more than 1.5. Those who have symptoms that cannot be explained by another cause and the anatomy is favorable, meaning that the procedure is much lower risk and the benefit outweighs the risk of the procedure. Of course, percutaneous mitral commissurotomy is contraindicated in the presence of a left atrial thrombus for risk of defragmentation by the mitral commissurotomy device, more than mild mitral regurgitation. And let me tell you that this is not very strict because, for example, in centers that perform heavy heavy flow of percutaneous mitral commissurotomy. Sometimes they do it for those with moderate mitral regurgitation as well. And we have some very expert operators that can perform the procedure actually. And this is the role for the expertise, as we said, and the different uh, at the different centers. So, of course, severe or bicommissural calcification carry a risk of uh, post-procedure mitral regurgitation and the risk of uh, a severe surgical complication, a severe complication that mandates surgery, absence of commercial fusion as well, 
severe concomitant aortic valve disease or severe combined tricuspid stenosis and regurgitation, which will not be treated by the intervention. So you're going to perform an intervention for the mitral valve and the surgery for the aortic valve. It's illogic. You need to perform one procedure for both. Or, of course, as we said, a concomitant coronary artery disease that needs a bypass surgery. So this is a very simple resume of what we said. How are you going to manage a clinically significant mitral stenosis? Anatomically, the mitral valve area is less than 1.5. So you ask yourself, as we said, what are the symptoms of the patient? Is the patient symptomatic? Yes, he is symptomatic. And he does not have a contraindication to percutaneous mitral commissurotomy, then he will not make a surgery. If he has a contraindication, he will go to surgery. If he doesn't have a contraindication, then does he have a high risk for surgery? Yes, he will perform a mitral commissurotomy. No, he's not high risk for surgery. He is favorable clinically to perform a percutaneous mitral commissurotomy. Before you proceed, you need to see the anatomical characteristic. Is this valve favorable to be technically dilated by the balloon? Yes, it is favorable to be technically dilated by the balloon. Go on and perform the percutaneous mitral commissurotomy. No, it is not technically available to be dilated, but clinically there are favorable characteristics. You may perform it, as we said here, if the symptoms occur at a low level of exercise and the operative risk is low and the center is highly experienced, otherwise you will go to surgery. Okay, the other situation, we have a mitral valve area less than 1.5. The patient is symptomatic? No, he denies symptom. As Professor Amir said, he does not have symptom because he has a sedentary lifestyle, for example. Okay, perform an exercise test. He got the symptoms? Yes. Is favorable for percutaneous mitral commissurotomy anatomically? Yes, perform the mitral commissurotomy. No, perform the surgery because he is unfavorable for mitral commissurotomy. This is after the exercise test. Which profile of patients I would refer for exercise test? The patient that a high risk of embolism or hemodynamic compensation. The two patients that we said previously, the high thromboembolic risk, the history of systemic embolization, the dense sac in the left atrium, the new onset paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, or those at high risk for hemodynamic compensation, pulmonary artery pressure more than 50 at rest, or a need for major non-cardiac surgery or a desire for pregnancy. Finally, this I will give a very small hint because it was mentioned in the guidelines about the echo scoring because this is a part of Identifying the proper anatomical features. This is the Wilkins score. The Wilkins score has four subsets or four points to evaluate upon. The mobility, the thickening, the calcification, and the subvalue. So number one, if it's highly wild with only tips restricted. Number two, the mid and basal portion of the leaflets have normal mobility. Score three. The valve continues to move forward in diastole, mainly from the base. And part four and score number four, there is no or minimal forward movement of the leaflet in diastole. The patient will get one or two or three or four points in the subset of mobility. The subset of thickening, one point if the leaflets are near normal thickness, four to five millimeters. Two points if the mid leaflets are normal, but the thickening at the margin is five to eight millimeter. Three points if the thickening extends through the entire leaflet, five to eight millimeter, and four points if there's considerable thickening of all the leaflets beyond eight to ten millimeter. Regarding calcification, a single area of increased echo brightness, one point, scattered areas of brightness but confined to the margins of the leaflet, two point. The brightness extend to the mid portion of the leaflet, three point. The extensive brightness throughout much of the leaflet tissue, four point. Regarding the subvalvular thickening, minimal thickening just below the mitral leaflet, one point. Thickening of the cordy extending to one third of its length, two points. Thickening of the cordy extending beyond two thirds down to the distal third of the cordy, three points. 
for extensive thickening and shortening extending down to the papillary muscle this is four points the total score of the sum of the four items will range from four to sixteen and the unfavorable anatomy score if it is beyond eight the favorable is eight or below the final will be the Cormier score and the Cormier score is for the immediate outcome prediction of course the echocardiographic variable the mitral valve a less than one it will take two points the maximum leaflet displacement less than 12 millimeter three points the commercial area to ratio more than 1.25 three points the subvalvular involvement three points the low risk group is score from zero to three intermediate four and five high from six to eleven this shows the immediate outcome prediction the lower you have the score means that those items are less present so actually it means that the anatomy is very favorable so it means that the outcome will be very favorable as well and Thank you so much. I will stop here. We will take some moderated questions from Professor Red and Professor Amir, and then Pro Professor Karim will start sharing his slides. So uh, I will pass the mic to Professor Reda first, and then Professor Amir. Uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Zahron. Uh, actually, it is very concise, and uh, you are tackling all the points. I have to comment on the scoring system. As you know, the contraindication usually putting a lot on the Wilkins score. And regarding to our daily practice, you know that uh, Wilkins score is not the cornerstone for uh, our judgment on the cases. Because sometimes the Wilkins score is eight, so it is favorable, but in particular, if the subvalvular is three or four, you know that the outcome is not that good in this patient. There is nothing in my consideration is contraindicated. It is related to the risk of the procedure, the incidence of failure. If I have a high failure rate and a high complication rate, this means it's contraindicated. Because sometimes we found that there is extensive fibrosis at the site of the commissures, and we found that the depth of the fibrosis is extreme. And sometimes we found that it is a unicommissural severe fibrosis and the other is actually partially splitted. When you introduce uh, the patient to the uh, balloon valvuloplasty, you will find that the, all the strengths go to, go to the semi-splitted commissures which lead to rupture and tear. And at that point, you expected there is a complication. Despite the score system is okay. So it is not just the scoring. Each patient has his own uh, facility, procedure. Sometimes you, you use a single balloon. Sometimes you need a double balloon. Sometimes you need to open the commissures. Sometimes you, you know that the subvalvular uh, apparatus is very poor, especially in mitral. We look to the leaflet all the time. Uh, uh, Wilkins score searching for the leaflets, the thickening, the mobility, the calcification, all related to the leaflets. And they forgot everything about the commissures. For that reason, there is a lot of uh, uh, other scoring system which put the commissure uh, and its effusion and the depth of the fibrosis uh, at the point to calculate the complication because if you uh, expecting there is a complication, you will be ready for this complication. This is the, the first thing related to the procedure. The second problem we have it here in Egypt, usually we utilize the double balloon technique as it is more cheaper than the in with a single balloon technique. And usually with mitral stenosis, we have a problem of small left ventricle. And you all the time facing the problem to make a dilatation of the valve with huge septostomy because actually the balloon opens the septum and open the, the, leaf, the, the valve itself. 
or vice versa, you go through the LV and you touching the LV and causing the penetration of the LV. For that reason, we didn't empower our data to select the appropriate lens of the balloon, which make a good stability at the site of the valve. Despite of that, not go through the LV to make a perforation of the LV or going to the area between the septum and the LV, because actually during even septostomy, this area to us is blind area. I can expect its position, but actually I couldn't see it. So I didn't uh, estimated the distance between the septum and the valve. This is another issue and we haven't a lot of work in these uh, uh, situations. Yes, a mitral valve, as we all know, is a three-dimensional structure and we perform it under fluoroscopy, cutaneous mitral commissurotomy, which is only two dimensions. And then we keep moving between two perpendicular views so we can get a proper idea and merge those images inside our brain. The issue, of course, is that the mitral valve is also not circular. So uh, although it's easier to perform the percutaneous mitral commissurotomy with the single balloon technique, the NWE, but it's a little bit more anatomical to perform it with a multi-track or the two balloons. But as you said, the left ventricle is small and you need to get an interatrial septal puncture in a proper distance from the mitral apparatus so you can give stability because sometimes you cannot stabilize your balloons inside. This is a very technical question. I have some tips and tricks here, but I would like to learn from uh, Amir. So I will pass this question to Amir and uh, let me learn from him some tips and tricks, what he does, whether with the single or the two balloons. And then I will give Haysam the mic also because I know Haysam works a lot balloon mitral. Uh, so we can have like a, uh, multiple uh, multiple experts discussion about this. So please, Amir, you have the mic. Uh, actually, I have limited experience in two balloon in two balloons technique. Uh, I only work with uh, the single uh, balloon technique. So we might uh, uh, we might uh, need to listen to Heisen. We know that we are, we came from the same uh, uh, school here uh, in the mitral intervention. So, two, and I think Karim has a limited experience in two. But I think, Haysam, your voice is a little bit uh, snoochy. Uh, it's not clear at all. You Maybe your mic. You can hear me now. Uh, no, it's not clear. There's like an interference with your voice. You're speaking from an earphone. Maybe it's better to speak directly from the laptop, maybe, because... Uh... So until I some uh, gets connected... Uh... Hello? No, it's not, it's not working, guys. Um, we cannot hear you properly. So sometimes uh, for stabilizing, or it's going to be a little bit uh, difficult, uh, it would be very nice to uh, perform because I, I, I have been assisting. Uh, uh, yes, Haysam, I think Haysam is back. Haysam, uh, yeah. you can hear me? Yes, okay, that's perfect. That's perfect. So uh, me and Amir are coming from the same school of intervention. Uh, we do have a very limited experience uh, in two balloon technique, we uh, we mainly work with uh, the Inui uh, system, so we cannot uh, give you any information about the tips and tricks in this particular situation um, in two balloon technique. I'm sorry to disappoint. So maybe 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 it's going to be me because I come from the center that works with two balloons. So uh, uh, from uh, let's say that I do not perform. Uh, the balloon mitral uh, so frequently because I'm so obsessed by the coronaries and the complex uh, PCI procedures. But uh, every now and then I get a case and I'm glad to assist and be assisted by lots of my experienced friends from uh, Enchamp University. Sometimes we do dilatation uh, first by one balloon. Uh, we enter one balloon and we make the dilatation by one balloon. So we get uh, space 
to stabilize the second balloon. Uh, the two balloons, as I learned, when they pass across the wire, uh, they, one balloon has uh, one uh, ostium and the other balloon crosses from like the PCI balloon from two sides. So usually you need to choose which balloon to pass first because this gets a difference. The coiling of the heavy wire that we use to support the balloon, the more uh, the coils and the wider, wider the range of the coiling, the more the stability you get. And of course, it always goes with the operator experience at the site of the interatrial septal puncture. Sometimes on the puncture site is very low or very high. You cannot pass the equipment very properly, but I have seen punctures from very, very uh, directed points actually, where the whole procedure would have been between eight and 11 minutes. And I was surprised by the uh, very good adequate outcome. The first question of Professor Reda is very important that sometimes, and uh, the drawbacks of the Wilkins score, focusing upon the leaflets rather than the other uh, important uh, anatomical features, because I guess we are, we are far more experienced uh, than the Western society regarding the rheumatic mitral stenosis and the percutaneous mitral commissurotomy because we have lots of patients and we were maybe uh, one of the generations that still saw lots of rheumatic mitral stenosis treated by percutaneous mitral commissurotomy compared to the younger generation nowadays because the incidence of rheumatic heart disease is getting less and less. So actually, yes, uh, I have seen all, all anatomical features, what they call unfavorable anatomical features or unfavorable anatomical characteristics. I have seen them in particular situations performing a percutaneous mitral commissurotomy. And I have seen them performing, let's say, a palliative percutaneous mitral commissurotomy by which you do not need to achieve a more than 2 centimeter or 2.5 centimeter square mitral valve. You just get some dilatation to pass a specific phase of life, whether this phase, let's say, was pregnancy, whether this phase was going to a surgery. Maybe here Amir would help us very well because maybe performing with one balloon, yes, but you have a big profile of patients. What are the specific anatomical features, Amir, that you are searching for in your patients, which would say, okay, this is not a patient for percutaneous mitral commissurotomy by any means, which is the most important point that you look for technically to say that this patient is anatomically not feasible to perform a percutaneous mitral commissurotomy? Uh, okay. Uh, at first, let's uh, remember how the balloon uh, works in uh, percutaneous mitral commissurotomy. The balloon works by splitting off uh, the commissures. Uh, and as Dr. Agada said, uh, this point is missing in all the scores of uh, uh, all the scores evaluating uh, the mitral valve, the state of the commissures. Uh, so, as uh, we have uh, seen in the guidelines, uh, we have two contraindications for the balloon mitral related to the commissures. One is uh, absence of fused commissures, and we see uh, the absence of fused commissures either in patients with uh, uh, other etiology other than rheumatic heart disease, like in patients with degenerative valve disease, or in patients with rheumatic heart disease who had previous uh, balloon mitral valve iroplasty. Sometimes we find that the valve became uh, stenotic again without fused commissures. And in these cases, balloon valve iroplasty will not be an option. This is the first case related to the commissures. Another, uh, another problem related to the commissure is, uh, uh, is the presence of uh, severe calcifications at uh, one or both commission. This would be a, a contraindication for balloon mitral valve iloplast. Other, uh, other known contraindications, uh, uh, the presence of left atrial appendage thrombus, despite, uh, despite the patients being on anticoagulation. When we find left atrial appendage thrombus, we usually leave the patient for one to three months, and then we repeat transesophageal echocardiography. 
the persistence of uh, left atrial appendage thrombus despite anticoagulation will be a contraindication for uh, balloon valvuloplasty. The presence of more than mild mitral regurgitation, again, of course, will be a contraindication for uh, valvuloplasty. All these uh, uh, together with uh, Wilkins score uh, uh, may provide uh, may provide us with uh, whether this valve is suitable for valvuloplasty or not. So it's better in uh, writing while uh, while writing the report in echocardiography. It's better to just describe the valve, not only uh, just mention the score, but it's it's very important to describe uh, the extent of thickness, the extent of calcification, uh, the status of the commissures, uh, the presence of uh, subvalvular thickening, and how it's uh, short, how, how the extent of affection, and whether it's markedly shortened or not, it's, uh, it's advisable to uh, illustrate and describe exactly in the echocardiographic report instead of just mentioning uh, the score. Sam, uh, would you like to add something to what Professor Amir uh, just said? Actually, uh, Amir had said it uh, elegantly. Uh, we have in order not to something. Uh, and, your, uh, earphones, uh, your earphones are uh, a little bit. Uh, Professor Red, I would like to ask you about the subvalvular apparatus because uh, I know that the subvalvular apparatus has a little bit uh, more, uh, or not more, but has a little bit you are, importance. Now you hear me there? Ah, ah, yeah, this is very nice. This is okay. very nice. Okay, no, uh, after that, I will pass the question to you. No, uh, from YouTube, uh, they are talking about the modality, the stress modality of choice uh, in patients with mitral stenosis, whether it's a dobutamine echo or it's a treadmill exercise. Treadmill exercise, okay. Okay. Professor Reda, what do you think? Would you like to perform uh, for your patient a uh, dobutamine uh, pharmacological stress echo, or would you like to make him run on the treadmill and uh, see his uh, functional capacity as well? Uh, to me, uh, I, has an, uh, an, uh, I have an experience before in a patient with a controversy uh, the mitral valve area of this patient was uh, 1.8. And there is a debate uh, because the patient is severely symptomatic by shortness of breath. And we measured it multiple times. Every time we found that the mitral valve area is 1.8. So according to the guideline, there is no need actually to do a balloon valvuloplasty for this patient. Uh, we decided to do a deputamine echo for this patient, and we found that the gradient across the mitral severely, severely increased. And even the patient went to a impending pulmonary edema. For that reason, uh, to me, I'd like usually to uh, go through the uh, deputamine uh, stress echo because actually it increasing the heart rate and I can calculate the gradient of the patient by a very safely way. And it is uh, in my hand. I, I know some of people afraid from the arrhythmia which may, can, which may occur during the deputamine, especially in a patient with structural heart disease like a valvular heart disease. But I'm usually preferring the, uh, the deputamine echo than treadmill stress uh, type. Totally, I totally agree with you. This highlights the point that we said in the guidelines that the area 1.5 is not like uh, a red line. You can dilate uh, if symptoms is, uh, is prevalent. You can dilate more than 1.5 centimeters square, but so long as you have provoked symptoms by an exercise test. The second point is that the vitamin echo is a very safe procedure. I, I have worked during my uh, early phases, the vitamin echo for more than five years, and I've done more than 1,000 cases. I never got arrhythmia in except maybe one single case. So uh, it's a very safe procedure. As Professor Reda said, it's a very available tool and you can get lots of data and take care that we did not talk about the mitral, the gradient across the mitral valve 
because I was keeping this question uh, to be the next question. So since uh, Professor Rada raised it, uh, I would like to ask Amir, uh, what is the gradient by which you would uh, reassess the area by another method? Because calculating the area by planimetry and pressure half time, I know that there is some drawbacks for pressure half time, planimetry overcome these drawbacks, but sometimes you need to incorporate another piece of information with the area calculated by planimetry and definitely this piece of information would include the uh, mean pressure gradient across the mitral valve. So uh, what is your advice about this particular point? Uh, okay. Uh, at first, planimetry is uh, the standard in evaluating uh, the severity of uh, mitral stenosis, as we all know. Uh, the gradients and the pressure half time, uh, we do not use them uh, for uh, classification uh, of the severity. However, they have a prognostic uh, value. Uh, why? Because the gradients uh, might be affected by many factors, like if the patient uh, has uh, some other valvular disease, like aortic regurgitation, or if the patient uh, has diastolic dysfunction, the gradient might be affected, the gradient might be uh, underestimated. However, the valve area is a standard in, uh, in classification of uh, the severity of mitral stenosis. Uh, on the other side, uh, in the clinical practice, sometimes we encounter some patients like, uh, like Dr. Reza, like Dr. Reza uh, has uh, explained, with discordance between the symptoms and uh, the mitral valve area. We have a mitral valve area above 1.5, but the patient is symptomatic. And uh, at this scenario, uh, we need to exercise these patients. Uh, in my clinical practice, I usually prefer to do uh, either treadmill or uh, bicycle or uh, uh, any form of physiological testing and uh, uh, to have a look on the gradients and the pulmonary artery pressure during exercise. Uh, 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 the, cu the cutoff value is uh, usually uh, the rise of the gradients across the mitral valve to be more to be more about to more to be above 15 or 16 millimeter mercury during exercise, or uh, rise of the pulmonary artery pressure to be above 60 millimeter uh, mercury during uh, during exercise. These are the cutoff values that we use during uh, exercise testing. In mitral, uh, in mitral stenosis. On the other side, when we have uh, patients with severe uh, mitral stenosis with valve area less than 1.5 and is apparently asymptomatic, uh, these cases we will again we will need to do exercise testing, physiological uh, treadmill or bicycle to know uh, how long the patient will be able to exercise and uh, the what is the functional capacity of the patient. It will be accepted if the patient achieved uh, above uh, 7 to 10 uh, METs uh, in this exercise test. Uh, I have, uh, so I have one comment. Ali. Yes, please. Um, as in our practice, usually we found a, a huge discrepancy between the patient related to symptomatology. You may find a patient with severe valvular affection, and he is completely asymptomatic. Uh, and in other issue, we can found a patient with uh, severe, a lot of symptoms, and you find that his valve disease is not that severely affected. At this point, I will regain the, the paragraph from Dr. Amir, the functional capacity of the patient. Because sometimes you feel that the patient, the patient is a housewife, just she's working inside the, uh, her home. And she's not complaining. Her symptom is related to this function of her. So searching and comment on the words of functional capacity, which is making uncovering of the disease. For that reason, because actually even in reduced ejection fraction, you may find a patient who is severely impaired LV with ejection fraction less than 30, and the patient is completely compensated. And you may find another patient with ejection fraction around 
40 or 45, and you found that the patient is severely symptomatic. This is a, 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 a question usually you're asking yourself why that occur, and I think it referred to the functional capacity or the functional reserve of the patient or, or adaptation of the patient or whatever the pathophysiology, which making a patient symptomatic or the other is non-symptomatic. This, uh, this is a very good, uh, a very good point to raise the duration of the valvular affection. And also, I would like to highlight the associated valvular affection. Sometimes uh, you have a mitral stenosis and the mitral evacuations, and you get an elevated LV in diastolic pressure or uh, elevated uh, filling pressure. So you get pulmonary congestion, you get more than one valve affected. Sometimes you have aortic stenosis, the situation is a little bit masked. You don't know sometimes. The duration, the mitral, uh, the, especially the mitral stenosis, the, sometimes you get patients that who can uh, get dilated left atriums and prolonged uh, cascade for several years. And sometimes you get patients that get deteriorated once they reach the 1.5 or the 1.4, the 1.6. What's your experience, I mean, at which particular area do you think the patient uh, succumbs and said, okay, I cannot tolerate any more and I need to dilate my valve. It is the 1.5 or is it the 1.2 or is it the 1.8? What's your experience? Um, uh, sorry, sorry, Zahran, can you repeat? Can you repeat again? I was raising the point that sometimes the patient duration of the disease uh, that not every single patient are alike. Sometimes you get a patient that tolerates the stenosis very well. Sometimes due to associated valvular lesions or due to associated uh, LV diastolic dysfunction, the patient gets deterioration quickly in the form of pulmonary congestions and inability, breathlessness, inability to, to perform effort. I mean, is this only related to the mitral valve area or there is other uh, like uh, ventricular stiffness, like associated valvular lesions, like age of the patient, like duration of the mitral stenosis process. I mean, from your experience, what do you think are the interplaying factors here? Okay, uh, this is a very good and a very difficult question because as uh, just you have said, uh, we are dealing with multifactorial uh, disease. It's not simple and it's not uh, straightforward. Uh, uh, answer and that's why uh, it's difficult and that's why every patient uh, should have individualized care assessing uh, assessing everything assessing the symptoms assessing uh, the ventricular function the presence of other valve diseases uh, uh, so we don't have a clear cutoff uh, or a clear answer for this question every case should be individualized this is my answer. I know it's not. Uh, uh, it's a very it's wise a answer and it's a very practical answer. And this is how we go with the coronaries. This is how we go with the valves. What do you think, uh, Professor Reda? Every patient is a different uh, clinical scenario than every other patient. What do you think? For, for that reason, yes, I agree, totally agree. For that reason, there is no guideline fit for all patients, it is only yes. guidance. The other things, usually we put a cut point for the uh, valvular area, mitral valve area more than, less than 1.5 with this cut point. We didn't issue for the surface area of the patient. Is it 1.5 uh, centimeter for a body uh, surface area or body weight uh, of, uh, let's to say 130 kg, and the length is, the height of the patient is 170, it is equal like a 50 kg patient and short stature, 150 length. So the body surface area in relation to the mitral or the valve area, I think it should to be correlated. It is not like that 
it is 1.5, 1.7. No, it is. It should to be corrected to the body surface area. This is my opinion. I don't know they, what they is correlated. Your uh, yes, they correlated it very well for the aortic valve because uh, of the it's related directly to the cardiac output. But maybe in the mitral, it's not uh, correlated because it's mainly a diastolic filling of the left ventricle, so it's not that important. But actually. It's correlated and it has a correlation because the size of the patient also will affect his activity. If the size of the patient is a little bit smaller, slimmer, he may be more active and surprisingly he may be more symptomatic. The heavier, bigger and older one may be more sedentary and his exercise may be less. So maybe adversely he will be less symptomatic. I think, the, I think it's the interplaying factors between the surface area indexing and the exercise level as well and the activity level uh, and it, it cannot it cannot be covered or fulfilled from all aspects as you said by a guidelines that should be very strictly followed but actually you should tailor the treatment plan uh, as per patient because uh, it differs from one patient to another this was very interesting uh, conversation and discussion actually i enjoyed it so much we need to move to the second half uh, of the webinar. Uh, my dear friend, uh, Professor Karim Mahmoud from Cairo University will be showing us three different clinical scenarios with mitral stenosis. And he will show us uh, together with uh, Professor Reda and Professor Amir uh, the discussion about how to reach uh, the most appropriate uh, management strategy for every particular patient of those. So uh, thank you so much. And uh, Karim, you have the uh, thank you so much, uh, Mohammed. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, your uh, presentation, and uh, I really enjoyed uh, the elegant moderation from uh, Dr. Amir and Dr. Ghali. So, uh, in this uh, second part of the webinar, I'll show uh, some uh, real real life cases of uh, mitral stenosis. And this is the first one. She is a 25 year old female. Uh, she had a in the form of recurrent tonsillitis, arthralgia, and intake of long acting penicillin. And she complains of progressive dyspnea over the past two years. Now, her uh, functional class is three. And the, she reported single attack of hemopsis examination. She had a variable S1 opening snap and the mental historic rambling murmur. And the ECG showed an atrial fibrillation with a, a, a heart rate of 100 beats per minute. So uh, this is her echocardiography. Uh, as you can appreciate uh, the presence of uh, significant mitral stenosis. And I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Rada, uh, this is practical question about how to assess uh, the mitral stenosis and uh, the, uh, if this valve is liable to a balloon or not. At this uh, view, it is not uh, enough because actually you should have a short axis at the mitral valve. But from this uh, long axis uh, parasternal view, we can see that despite there is uh, a ankylosing a, uh, and limitation of the uh, movement of the valve, but the valve can travel uh, some uh, space uh, to hit the, uh, the, uh, the septum. So there is a separation which is around, not exceeding one centimeter, it is less than one centimeter. So I think it will be a significant mitral stenosis and I think the area will be around one or 1.2 maximum because actually the separation between the two leaflets is uh, less than one, around 0.8 or something like that. I didn't uh, measure it. Uh, there is a, a a good accepted mobility, so I can give this patient his uh, mobility too. Uh, the thickening uh, in the tab and in extending to parts of the body, so I can give the uh, uh, the thickening. And I think it is, uh, I I couldn't measure it by uh, this way, but it, it, from our experience, it is around the 0.8 milli or something like that. Uh, there is two uh, strikes of calcification at the tip and at the junction between the body and the base. 
so uh, I can give him uh, two also. So till the point it uh, it is around the uh, uh, two 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 uh, six, and I couldn't see the subvalvular well by this way. Uh, I think I can think. I think the subvalvular around two. So I think it is appropriate uh, valve for. Uh, balloon uh, dilatation, but I need to see the commercials also. But according to the Wilkins score, it is maybe uh, eight, so it is feasible for a balloon dilatation. Um, uh, actually, thank you, Dr. Agada. You have uh, an expert eye, uh, as you uh, mentioned, uh, all the criteria of Wilkins score for assessment of the aortic valve. So I'll just add uh, uh, the presence of uh, mild degree of uh, mitral incompetence as you can appreciate here. And we have also aortic valve disease, but the aortic regurgitation here looks uh, mild to moderate, so it is not uh, significant uh, aortic valve disease. Here is, uh, uh, as Dr. Agada uh, mentioned, the importance of short axis view to show the uh, mitral valve and uh, to assess and do the planimetry that uh, is mentioned to be a very important in assessment of the severity of uh, mitral stenosis. Here we cannot uh, see a significant calcification in both commissure and actually both commissures here uh, are few. So here this is a uh, apical for chamber view. Again we can appreciate uh, the poor separation of, uh, of the mitral, uh, mitral valve with the presence of uh, a mild degree of mitral incompetence. And the hemodynamics is, uh, is important as well. The aortic valve here, we don't have uh, an, a much gradient on the aortic uh, valve. And remember, these patients have an atrial fibrillation, so we should have at least five uh, cycle or five measurement and take uh, the average. So uh, the gradient uh, of the, uh, on the aortic valve is not so high. Uh, however, the, we have an increased gradient uh, across the mitral valve. And as mentioned before, we should not depend on the pressure half time in uh, the patient with rapid atrial fibrillation and as well in the patient with it, uh, aortic regurgitation, as this will affect the measurement of the mitral valve area. Here we have a significant pulmonary hypertension that is attributed due to the significant obstruction caused by the mitral valve disease. So, Dr. Amir, you see the transthoracic uh, cardiography. What do you think is the next appropriate step? Okay, here the patient uh, the patient has uh, severe uh, isolated mitral stenosis. Uh, there is no uh, other uh, severe associated uh, valvular disease. Uh, the valve morphology uh, looks favorable for percutaneous uh, uh, valvuloplasty. Uh, so the next step is uh, to prepare the patient for uh, percutaneous commissurotomy by doing uh, transesophageal echocardiography to exclude left atrial appendage thrombus, uh, and then uh, to proceed for uh, a percutaneous valvuloplasty. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amir. And this is actually what was done. Here is a transesophageal echocardiography that uh, confirmed that this valve is uh, favorable for uh, percutaneous mitral commissurotomy and the absence of significant degree of mitral incompetence. We can appreciate as well the absence of uh, the with no evidence from by. And subvalvular apparatus uh, is, is not uh, yeah, is somewhat shortened, but it's not looks uh, so thickened. Uh, I believe that the view for showing that subvalvular apparatus is a transnegative view. And we have uh, some disease of the aortic valve, but it is not severe. So based on that, Dr. Agada, what do you think is, uh, is the management? Is this, is, uh, is this information uh, uh, satisfactory or we need any other information? And if it's satisfactory, what would uh, be the next uh, management? Uh, as the data shown, uh, the mitral valve area is one. 
so it is the uh, severe mitral stenosis by definition. Uh, regarding to the uh, mitral valve score and the commissure uh, shape, it is favorable for talon uh, dilatation, and there is no contraindication in TE. So we can proceed to the uh, balloon valvuloplasty and the question, which type you will prefer, uh, two balloon or single balloon? Uh, and this is the, the first thing. The second thing I need to ask you question. I know the accuracy of the TE to evaluate the mitral regurgitation, but do you think the TE overestimating the mitral regurgitation especially when there is a gray zone, uh, the mild to moderate. Sometimes you find that it is mild, but actually it is toward to moderate. Uh, you will go by TE judgment or transthoracic judgment. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ayada. Uh, actually, um, uh, uh, I think the expertise uh, uh, play, plays a role in uh, consideration of uh, which type of balloon we should uh, we should use. Uh, however, we uh, based on uh, uh, the expertise in our center, we choose the the, the Inui balloon, which is uh, the one uh, balloon, one balloon technique. Uh, regarding the second question uh, of the assessment of the aortic uh, mitral regurgitation, actually the, the transesophageal cardiography is uh, very sensitive in evaluating uh, the mitral valve disease and the left atrium. And uh, I would uh, depend more on the severity based on the transesophageal echocardiography rather than the transthoracic echocardiography. In uh, many cases, we uh, are not sure about the severity of the mitral regurgitation by transthoracic echocardiography. We send the patient to, to do a transesophageal echocardiography as it's more accurate for evaluating the mitral incompetence. Um, I need to put just a small comment. Sometimes when we have argue about the transthoracic, because I know the uh, TE is most sensitive, but usually I have a, a lot of patients in the gray zone. Nobody will uh, argue if it is mild is mild or moderate is moderate. But when there is a gray zone, usually we, we, we would like to, to do uh, ventriculography and uh, assess the mitral regurgitation by uh, this way. And the, uh, to have two from one. Because usually as interventionists, we would like to do a dilatation more than to do a, a surgery. And sometimes we, actually all the time, we, we, we do, the, it, we operate the patient mild, even to moderate, and sometimes moderate, but not moderate to severe. When there is a mitral regurgitation area around a sharp four or even five, sometimes we are doing a balloon valvuloplasty for bridging or for, um, for sometimes to push the patient upwards uh, till the time of uh, uh, surgery, especially when there is uh, a, another valve affection will need a surgery in the future. Um, thank you, Dr. Agada. But uh, do you think uh, the, the need for ventriculography, um, uh, I think uh, we need it for uh, mainly for assessment of the mitral incompetence that is extremely eccentric and uh, it's not uh, and, uh, it's not uh, easy to be assessed using uh, both modality uh, echo uh, transthoracic and transesophageal echocardiography uh, we, this is, we just this is... we just present an excuse for us to operate the patient nothing more than that i I'm, i know 100 percent uh te is a very sensitive tool for assessment of mitral uh, regurgitation uh, but sometimes we need to convince ourselves, no, it is not that severe. So we will just do one injection before the procedure. Actually, usually we, we, we made the decision, we will operate the patient. And we know it is moderate, but we need some excuse to us to operate the patient. Because actually, when you have a moderate a, a, a mitral, a, sorry, aortic regurgitation or uh, even moderate aortic stenosis, you need, you actually know that the patient in the future will need redo. 
uh, or a, doing a surgery. So you trying to push the area towards a balloon dilatation for a while, and then you know that you will go for surgery later on, especially uh, in a female condition, and especially uh, if the patient is in the childbearing period, as you know. Okay, uh, so uh, I think this is a speech of an expert in the, in the balloon mitral. However, uh, I think we have uh, uh, many followers that are starting uh, their career uh, in uh, doing this uh, balloon mitral. So what do you think, Dr. Ghada? Should we generalize this uh, information uh, for them or to just to stick to the basics in the uh, mitral and leave this for the expert like you, Dr. Ghada, and uh, for uh, the other doing this uh, uh, balloon mitral regularly? No, stick with the guideline. If you are a beginner, stick. Even sometimes I couldn't uh, do that because actually I stick with the guideline. But when you speak with actually with our professors uh, who are more expert than us, they put the strategy as also you know that part from the guideline is an expert opinion. And the, we, we said before, not all the guideline fit for all others. But in educational material, we should to stick with the rule and we should we should to stick with the guideline. So thank you, Dr. Agada. So I think the message is this is, is not an uh, easy task and uh, it needs a uh, uh, many consideration. Uh, we should respect the expertise. However, we should also respect that uh, um, the routine, uh, 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 the routine assessment and management of each patient should refer back to the guidelines and the individualized decision should based on the expertise of the center or the, or, on, and the, or the operators. So why it is not a, an easy mission? Uh, I'd, ask, I'd like to ask Dr. Amir about uh, one of the most important step, which is the septal puncture technique. So uh, how do you usually perform a septal puncture technique? Uh, okay, there are um, many ways to uh, determine uh, the point of uh, transeptal uh, puncture, uh, but uh, the most commonly used and uh, uh, the one I use most is uh, first to do it in the EP projection and to do a wortecrute injection. And uh, by after wortecrute injection, we determine the level of the aortic cusp we go uh, about half vertebrae below that level. And uh, this is the site of puncture. Uh, we usually uh, need to go uh, from lateral projection to EP projection to make sure that uh, the transeptal needle is uh, pointing uh, backwards towards the left eight. And, and that's it. And uh, of course, uh, it's a crucial step in performing uh, valvuloplasty, and it will need some time uh, to master, uh, and it will uh, it will need time to learn. That's it. And and what are the risks of uh, incorrect puncture, Dr. Amir? Okay. Uh, uh, the first, uh, if you go too high or too low in the puncture, this uh, will make. Uh, crossing uh, the valve uh, much more difficult. This is a first. Uh, 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 the much more uh, risky, uh, risky problem is uh, uh, puncturing the left atrial wall in a causing cardiac tamponade. And here, uh, and this is uh, the main concern on why doing the transeptor puncture is uh, doing the puncture elsewhere uh, away from away from the sept. In patients with rheumatic mitral stenosis, there is huge left atrial dilatation. The anatomy is uh, disturbed. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes a needle just go into the uh, left atrial wall. And uh, here, uh, usually the transeptor puncture uh, the problem when uh, if you did a wrong puncture in the left atrial wall with the transeptor puncture usually there is no problem with it but uh, the main problem 
when you uh, advance your equipment over the transeptal needle. So uh, you do a puncture in wrong area uh, away from the septum, and then you advance the monenches. You have a big hole in the heart, and then uh, you start seeing the patient uh, going tachycardic and hypotensive. And at that time, you, you know that uh, the patient is having cardiac tamponade. So oh, thank you, Amir. Uh, so this is uh, uh, some il illustration of the technique of septal puncture. Here we go with uh, sheath, a molen sheath, which is usually we use the uh, eight French sheath into the uh, superior vena cava, then into the uh, left brachiocephalic uh, vein. Uh, then we uh, in uh, introduce our septal needle and uh, withdraw the sheath and needle uh, back into the right atrium. In this uh, position, we usually uh, jump into the septum and goes into the fossa ovalis. This is not an easy and we need to check the position several times. However, after reaching the, the position of fossa ovalis, we do the puncture uh, and uh, we need uh, some confirmation that we are in the left atrium once we did the puncture. So uh, do you have any uh, idea how to confirm our presence uh, or uh, incorrect uh, puncture, uh, Dr. Agada? Uh, actually, there is a lot of uh, tips and tricks related to the, uh, the, the puncture because actually this is the most dangerous uh, uh, step during the procedure of uh, balloon dilatation. Uh, we have a lot of modality. We can use, uh, a, especially if we are beginner, uh, you can use a transesophageal echo to uh, be sure you are in appropriate place, or even transthoracic during the procedure. And the, actually, sometimes we we make an injection to uh, delineate the presence, the, the site of the septum, and we can put a big tail inside the aorta at the cusps to make us. Um, aware about the landmark because actually the mitral valve is below the aorta and it is directed downwards and laterally uh, because uh, actually I have a complication like that in my real life uh, during the, I think the third or the fourth time to me uh, during uh, doing a, a, a septostomy, we did a puncture in the aorta and it is a very risky and the patient collapsed during the procedure. Uh, first, we delineate our position in the uh, uh, EP view, and then we, we mustn't uh, go through the puncture, except when we are in the lateral position and we can see the needle uh, directed posterior towards the, the vertebrae to be uh, 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 directed towards the left atrium. And during the, uh, the septostomy, you are injecting all the time till you found the, you, you pass it because actually you sense it and you see it. And you found the, the, the dye uh, accumulating a, and delineate the roof of the left atrium. At that time, you should to introduce the sheath and remove uh, the needle. So there is many ways to uh, uh, facilitate the cystostomy and make it more safe uh, to add another uh, modality of visualization by transesophageal, because actually it uh, uh, make it uh, the septum uh, very obvious. I think 3D uh, echo now also making it uh, more easier because actually it uh, uh, delineates the septum and uh, showing the level of the uh, septostomy in relation to the mitral uh, valve. So I think it, uh, it, all this may help. I need to uh, uh, listen from uh, Dr. Amir. Uh, I don't have much to add, Dr. Ghada. Uh, I think you said uh, you said it all. Uh, uh, after crossing the, uh, the septum, uh, we make sure that we are in the left atrium. Uh, I use three things. 
first is uh, injecting a little amount of contrast and seeing it uh, floating in the left atrium. Second is uh, connecting the pressure uh, transducer and seeing the pressure waveform, uh, denoting when uh, denoting left atrial pressure, which is expected to be uh, very high in uh, microstenosis. And the third one is withdrawing a little amount of blood and seeing it uh, 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 oxygenated, bright uh, blood. These are the three things I use after uh, crossing the septum to make sure that I'm uh, at the left edge. Uh, but thank you, Dr. Ghada, uh, you have said it all. Okay, thank you. So thank you, uh, Dr. Ghada and Dr. Amir for this nice step, for this Im very important step in the uh, balloon mitral, which is the septal puncture. Uh, again, there is a thumb demonstration. This is the sheath uh, with the needle going down into the uh, two blue the uh, the cast the big tail caster in the aortic root, then uh, doing a puncture uh, in this uh, side, going into the left atrium and confirming our presence in the left atrium by the step mentioned by Dr. Agada and Dr. Amir. And uh, we uh, this is the lateral view Dr. Agada uh, mentioned, and we should uh, be sure that our needle and our sheath is away from the aorta, not to puncture uh, the aortic root. So next, this is our patient, and we do a small injection into the left atrium. We have a free-floating uh, dye into the left atrium. And then when we introduce the spiral wire, this wire helps to introduce uh, our balloon uh, over uh, this wire. And we did, this is a dilator to make uh, uh, an uh, access for our balloon through the interatrium uh, septum. And this is followed by passing the uh, one, uh, the inway balloon uh, into the left atrium. There is a some calcification at the annulus of the uh, mitral valve here you can appreciate. And we introduce the balloon into the, uh, the mitral valve. Here you can appreciate uh, this is the, the, the big tail inside the left atrium. And uh, this is actually the balloon slipped into uh, the mitral valve. This is not actually a good uh, uh, dilatation. So we uh, 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 withdraw it again and inflate it again. And we have uh, a good dilatation of the mitral valve. So after this procedure is the patient was stable, the mitral valve area actually increased to two centimeter. I, I, unfortunately, I don't have the echo post uh, cast and the gradient uh, uh, dropped uh, into the mean gradient of five millimeter mercury and she was charged on beta blocker and uh, long term anticoagulation as she was she had atrial fibrillation. So, uh, 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 Dr. Ghada, Dr. Amir, do we have a comment regarding the first case? Uh, I, I need to confirm on one thing, especially related to Enwi. Uh, when I go uh, through the mitral valve and go to the LV, I should uh, 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 I should to be sure one hundred percent that I'm not trapped between any cordy yeah. uh, because this may lead to cordy rupture. I, I need to see the the balloon floating freely before I uh, trapped it against uh, the valve. Because uh, this is one of the problem of the enemy. It goes through the LV easily, but it may be uh, between the cordy and the, the cordy usually shortened and fibrosed from the uh, uh, aromatic affection. So it is easily to be turned. So uh, this is my comment on that. Okay. Um, so thank you, Dr. Agada. Very, uh, very uh, important uh, comment. And uh, uh, it, it, uh, it avoids a lot of complication regarding the cordal rupture and causing acute mitral regurgitation. So uh, this is the second case. Uh, this is a male patient, 57 year old. He, is he has a diabetes mellitus and smoker and he's, he is known to have aromatic heart disease. His presentation to the emergency department with acute chest pain and shortness of breath. On examination, he has dyspnea at rest. His heart rate was 120 p per minute regular his blood pressure 100 over 60. He has an elevated jugular venous pressure with systolic expansion. He has a, a, some manifestation of COPD 
with barrel shape chest and vesicular breathing with prolonged expiration. However, also he have an, a, a, a signs of congestion in the form of the fine bilateral basal filication. He has a hepatomegaly on examination and there was no lower limb edema. The cardiac examination showed the apex was built in the left lateral position with accentuated first heart sound and pulmonary component of second heart sound with uh, S3 gallop over the apex and apical soft ventistolic murmur propagating to the axilla. So uh, this, is, this was his ECG uh, that showed the sinus tachycardia and evidence of left atrial dilatation and uh, evidence of left ventricular, uh, start left ventricular hypertrophy. The chest X-ray showed the cardiomegaly with evidence of uh, actually a pulmonary edema. There is a, a severe pulmonary congestion as seen in the lung uh, interstitium. And this is his echocardiography. As you can appreciate here is the parasternal long axis view. Uh, here we have uh, this uh, uh, mitral valve disease with a fixed posterior leaflet and limited excursion of the anterior leaflet. And we have also a significant calcification of uh, the tips of the leaflet. And in the uh, apical fourth chamber view, we have uh, also a an, an, uh, picture of impaired left ventricle with a regional motion abnormality involving the apex and the apical adjoining region. So, uh, what do what do you think, Dr. Agada or Dr. Amir, about uh, the etiology and diagnosis in these patients? Is it uh, just a, a, a aromatic heart disease with a mitral valve disease, or there is a something else causing this uh, picture? To me, it may be associated with coronary artery disease. It is very common. Your patient is fifty-seven. And we have more than 10% of our patient uh, association between coronary artery disease and the uh, rheumatic uh, heart disease. And also, uh, I think we, we uh, uh, support the uh, special protocol of any male or female above 40, like in surgery, uh, in, like in valve replacement. If the patient above uh, 40, we uh, usually do a uh, coronary angiography before the, uh, uh, the procedure because sometimes we need to do both the coronary intervention and the uh, balloon dilatation or, or, or even we found a complex lesion in the coronary and we sent the patient for a, 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 a surgery for both uh, mitral and coronary. Yes. Agree, Dr. Agada, and uh, this is uh, uh, our impression. We have an associated disease, and as you mentioned, this association is not uncommon, and it's present in our uh, in, in our uh, uh, population. Here also, we have a significant degree of uh, mitral regurgitation, and uh, here we can appreciate also the mitral valve disease and the presence of uh, 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 regional motion abnormality. So, and this is the, the conclusion of our, uh, our study. We have a patient presented with acute chest pain and he has a multiple risk factors such as diabetes mellitus and uh, smoking. Uh, he has a, a mitral valve disease and he has impaired ejection fraction with regional motion abnormality. So the decision as Dr. Agada mentioned is to do a coronary angiography that showed a uh, presence of a significant coronary artery disease. So what do you think, Dr. Amir? Uh, this is the, the, first, uh, the, 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 the first webinar discussion. Uh, what do you think is the best management for uh, these patients? Uh, actually, it's, uh, it's very nice to, to present uh, uh, this case and to see uh, a valve like that after the first case. In the first case, we saw uh, uh, a valve that, uh, that was favorable for uh, galveloplasty. In the second case, uh, we have uh, a valve with all uh, characteristics that uh, make it uh, not favorable for galveloplasty. The valve with severe mitral regurgitation and the valve is thickened, the subvalve apparatus is shortened. So uh, obviously, uh, this patient uh, we'll go for uh, mitral uh, valve replacement. 
And as we have uh, an epicardial coronary artery disease uh, with a stenosis uh, of about 80 to 90 percent of this patient, uh, according to the guidelines, we need uh, to have a concomitant uh, coronary artery bypass uh, grafting. So uh, this is was plan of management is to do a uh, uh, lima to LED and to uh, to do a mitral valve replacement. And I'd like to ask uh, uh, an, another question. If we have another scenario, this question for Dr. Amir and Dr. Gada. If we have an, another scenario with this uh, coronary artery disease and the favorable mitral valve with only mitral stenosis, what do you think uh, is the best management for this patient? So starting with. According to guideline or according to our practice? <laughs> to both, Dr. Agar. <laughs> according to the guideline, it will be for surgery. But according to the practice, it is doable LAD. Actually, it is doable LAD. This is the first thing. The second, uh, I think in Egypt, a lot of expertise with a, a very good uh, outcome and survival rate after balloon valvuloplasty. So uh, if I I found it is a favorable for interve intervention for uh, uh, coronary and the uh, valve, uh, despite it is not in the guideline by this uh, view, I'll go through the uh, uh, dilatation of the valve and the uh, PCI to the uh, uh, LAD. But according to the guideline, and because it is an educational material, it is indication you? for for surgery, definitely. What about you, Amir? Thank you, Dr. Yeah, yeah. I agree. My view is Dr. Reda. And if the patient, if the valve was favorable, uh, I would go for uh, valvilo, balloon valvio plus and PCI to LED. Okay. So uh, thank you so much. And we have this is a second patient with a coronary artery disease and uh, mitral valve disease, which uh, as we, we uh, mentioned is a common association, uh, especially in the patient uh, getting elderly. So uh, this is uh, the, third, the third scenario and last scenario for today, which is a 30-year-old lady. She has a history suggestive of rheumatic affection, uh, rheumatic fever uh, during childhood. And uh, she had uh, right-sided weakness and paresthesia two months ago before the presentation that completely resolved. And she complains of shortness of breath on her ordinary efforts, New York Heart Association Functional Class 2. It, her ECG showed the sinus rhythm with a heart rate of 95 feet per minute with a left atrial dilatation, and her chest X-ray was normal. This is an images from her echocardiography that showed the, the mitral valve. Uh, it uh, showed a mild stenosis. The report mentioned that the valve area is more than two. Uh, there is no commercial fusion, and the gradient is not so high. So for discussion, this is a young lady that has a neurological event that completely resolved. However, she had uh, uh, a mild mitral stenosis and she is in the sinus rhythm. So this is a question for uh, our moderator and for our attendees. Can stroke occur in mitral stenosis and sinus rhythm? Can I answer? Of course, Dr. Agad. Yes. Yes. First of all, you saw this patient now in a sinus rhythm, but she may have attacks of paroxysmal AF, and it may be in a controlled rate, so you don't know. This is the first. Second, yes, stroke can occur in sinus rhythm, despite it is less uh, uh, incidence, but it can occur. Okay, thank you, Dr. Agada. Uh, Amir, uh, what do you think? Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, stroke can occur in patients with microstenosis in sinusism because uh, atrial fibrillation might be uh, paroxysmal, and because patients uh, might have huge left atrial uh, dilatation without atrial fibrillation, and in these cases they might have uh, left atrial thrombi causing stroke. Okay. So, uh, I think uh, it is more, much also related to the left atrial appendage, the velocity uh, of entrance of the blood uh, in it, because usually in a mitral stenosis we can found that the left atrial appendage is dilated, and the uh, the blood is stagnant in it. 
micro impuli can be present or even a thrombi can be present. And sometimes we saw a heavy smoke shadow without a real thrombus. So, yes. So uh, definitely, yes. The atrial fibrillation increases the risk of a stroke or thromboembolism in mitral stenosis, even if the mitral stenosis is mild. However, uh, in the presence of sinus resin and uh, stroke, these patients can uh, should have an anticoagulation and the risk of stroke is, is present despite uh, these patients' sinus resin due to atrial fibrillation and left atrial remodeling causing left atrial dilatation. And if you can appreciate, this is an echocardiography, a uh, transfusional echocardiography from the patient with the mitral stenosis and the stroke. Uh, here, uh, uh, in the presence of atrial fibrillation, the incidence of uh, this uh, uh, thrombi inside the left atrium is high, as we can appreciate. Here we have a large left atrial appendage thrombus, which is the common site, as Dr. Agada mentioned, for the thrombus formation in the patient with atrial fibrillation. We have also, as Dr. Agada mentioned, a large, largely dilated left atrial appendage. So this is also a, a question of, uh, of debate. What is the type of anticoagulant you would prescribe uh, to this patient? Is it the uh, VKA or the uh, new oral anticoagulant? Uh, according to guideline, uh, mild mitral stenosis, we can give NOAC. Moderate to severe, moderate or severe mitral stenosis, by definition, we should to give uh, vitamin K. To me, any mitral stenosis, this is the guideline. To me, in any mitral stenosis, I'd like to go through a, uh, a warfarin or a uh, vitamin K antagonist and not uh, by NOAC, we need a lot of study because actually the problem is not related to the valve itself. It is related to the valve, it is related to the left atrium, it is related to the left atrial appendages, and the, there is a, a mini dilemma for that reason. And the patient has a risk, or actually, she has a, something like a transient ischemic attack. Uh, I think I need something to be monitored if the patient is uh, a, can do a regular uh, check uh, for the uh, anticoagulation by uh, uh, INR and PC and PT. Uh, so despite it is a mild mitral stenosis and according to the guideline, they can give me luxurious uh, use of MWAC, but I think I'll go to uh, vitamin K and that. Um, thank you, Dr. Agada. Actually, uh, I mentioned uh, a, a trial uh, that is, was a Korean trial studied uh, the NWAC in the patient with mitral stenosis and showed that the NWAC was favorable regarding the efficacy. However, uh, this trial, uh, the severity in the, of mitral stenosis was not clear in this uh, trial. So we need actually a more data before using the NWAC in patient with mitral stenosis. And uh, I believe uh, for me, I follow what you, you said, what you did the Flora Rada on what you mentioned. And I prescribed for this patient a VKA because uh, we don't have uh, 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 um, a good data till now about the use of uh, NOAC in the mitral stenosis. And maybe in the future, uh, there uh, may be a good data regarding this point. So uh, the other issue for this patient that can help the symptomatology is the rate control, either with the beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, and joxin, and we prescribe the beta blocker that help to control the rate in this patient. So I reached the, to the end of uh, uh, my cases. I, this is the, well, the third case with the patient with my, mitral stenosis and a stroke. It happens, and it can happen even if we don't have uh, atr atrial fibrillation because as we mentioned, atrial fibrillation can be paroxysmal and left atrial remodeling and the loss of left, at left atrial appendage function can uh, be the responsible for uh, the formation of thrombi. So I need to, uh, to hear a final comments from uh, Dr. Amir and Dr. Ghada. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Karim, for uh, the excellent presentations. Uh, and I really enjoyed uh, the discussion and the cases and uh, the presentation. Uh, Dr. Amir? Uh, Karim, can, can you hear me? Thank yes, Karim for uh, for the cases. Uh, uh. Hey. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Amir. Uh, Dr. Karim, we have a question uh, from the YouTube. Uh, do you have a cut-off point uh, for the left uh, atrial diameter to start anticoagulation in atrial uh, fibrillation and mitral stenosis? Uh, patient or without atrial fibrillation uh, in indicated patients with mitral stenosis due to left atrial dilatation? Okay. Uh, I, I think uh, this is a good question and uh, may the moderator uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the left, uh, with increasing the left atrial diameter, uh, the incidence of atrial fibrillation is increasing. Uh, this is because the left atrial remodeling is associated with increasing the incidence of atrial fibrillation and subsequent increase in the thromboembolic uh, events. So uh, regarding the left atrial diameter, it is not uh, the aim of management till now. The aim of management is the presence of a thromboembolic event, the presence of atrial fibrillation, because actually we still see patients with mitral stenosis and uh, large left atrium like 4.5, 4.6, uh, something like that. And uh, being in the sinus rhythm with no history of thromboembolic event, I believe these patients are not indicated for uh, anticoagulation. So I'd like to hear a comment uh, from Amir and Dr. Agada regarding this point. Um, as we uh, we saw uh, and as we follow in the guideline, the indication of anticoagulation is uh, to see thrombi by your eye, whatever the left atrium is small or large, or to diagnose AF, or the patient presenting by stroke or TIA. I should to have something to anticoagulate. But according to uh, the diameter of the left atrium, in presence of sinus rhythm I, and in absence of thrombi, I think there is uh, uh, no indication, no, no clear indication. I have no research suggesting a cut point for the left atrium to give anticoagulation or not to give uh, anticoagulation. There is no uh, enough research or answer for this question. The, uh, the enlargement of, uh, of left atrium equal more incidence of AF and more incidence to AF to be persistent and uh, permanent. Uh, so if it occurs, we will give anticoagulation. Uh, I have uh, I have comment. Uh, of course, I, I agree with Dr. Red and uh, with Dr. Karim. However, in the recent guidelines of uh, European Society of Cardiology uh, uh, for the management of valvular heart disease, uh, there is a comment uh, and a recommendation that in patients uh, with uh, marked left atrial enlargement, uh, when the anthroposterior diameter exceeds uh, 50 millimeter, or the left atrial uh, index volume exceeds uh, 60 millimeter in, uh, per square meter, they, they are recommending uh, oral anticoagulation even in the presence of uh, sinusitis. Uh, I agree with Dr. Reda that uh, this uh, was not based on uh, multiple trials uh, and uh, it was just expert op opinion. So we can, uh, we can uh, argue about it, but this is written in the guidelines. And these are the cutoff uh, values, uh, uh, anthroposterior diameter of uh, five centimeters uh, or left atrial uh, volume index of 60 uh, milli per square meter. So, do we have uh, any other question from YouTube, uh, Dr. Mohammed Zaran, Dr. Aysam Suleiman? Uh, 
No, uh, dear Karim, actually, uh, we don't have any more questions uh, from the YouTube uh, regarding this uh, lecture anymore. So, uh, if not, and uh, uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, to, to have a conclusion uh, to uh, my presentation uh, regarding the three cases. We should know that the balloon mitral uh, is a standard, of a standard plan of care for uh, managing uh, the mitral stenosis in the current era, providing that we choose the appropriate valve for balloon. Surgery is still an option, especially if we have an associated condition and associated valvular disease that necessitates surgery. And we should remember that uh, thromboembolism is, uh, thromboembolic risk is uh, still high in mitral stenosis, even in the presence of uh, sinus risk. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you all. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Ghada Qazamil and uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Amir Anwar for this elegant uh, moderation today. I'd like to thank my friend, uh, uh, Dr. Muhammad Zahran for his excellent presentation of the overview of the viable heart disease and mitral stenosis guideline. I'd like to thank uh, uh, our co-founders uh, in the CEC, Dr. Haytham Suleiman, uh, Dr. Ahmed Saeed, and Dr. Abdurrahman Gamal for managing the YouTube and uh, helping us in preparing this webinar. Thank you all. Uh, meeting you uh, next Thursday with uh, congenital webinar and uh, next uh, uh, th uh, Tuesday with the bifurcation uh, canvas and next uh, Thursday continuing uh, the valvular heart disease uh, track. Thank you so much and uh, good night to you all. Thank you. Have a nice time. Thank you. Thank you so much.